So what are we up to today? Lecture seven, Ethereum. Uh, it might seem like we're a little bit late in the pace here to get to Ethereum. In fact, we've mentioned it at least every single other lecture. And sometimes I just like mention stuff and don't even bother to go back and explain what it was that I was referencing or what it was that I was talking about, you know, with the intention that eventually we'll catch up to it. This is one of the problems with learning about blockchains in general is that there's like eight different things that you kind of have to individually look at first before it really starts to fit together. So I guess now, you know, is as good a time as any to have a whole session to talk just about Ethereum. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about some of the unique characteristics of Ethereum. Specifically, we'll be talking about consensus in Ethereum and how the Ethereum virtual machine actually does stuff, right? Ethereum is known for being a smart contracts platform. All right, so what does that look like and how does it, how does that play in? You know, smart contracts, this is one of these things I've mentioned a few times. Some of you have already started dabbling for your projects, yet we haven't covered any of it just yet. Okay, so before we can get there, y'all are in computer science, so what is Turing completeness? Okay, anyone wanna build on this? We have an idea of a state. Have you heard this term before? If not, you're gonna have trouble because it refers to a person. You're gonna have trouble if not. Any, anyone on this side? You all got it? All right, so a program that is that can simulate a Turing machine. So you're right. The trick is that we're now using like another term in terms of a Turing machine to define what Turing completeness is. But, but yes, you're, you're absolutely right. And so uh, a Turing machine is this idea. Before we actually had real computers, um, this guy, Alan Turing, came up with this idea about being able to process steps in computation. And so a Turing machine has this idea of a tape, which is your memory, and you can just write down what the steps are one by one iteratively, and at each subsequent step, you're updating the state of the program. And you can do this to perform um, sort of arbitrary computation. So Turing completeness now refers to this idea that we have a program that can do this arbitrary computation. So by arbitrary, I mean can execute basically some form of loop structure and basically do any computation that you can creatively come up with and code. So if you can code an algorithm or if you can represent a problem as an algorithm, that <coughs> a Turing complete program can solve that problem for you. You know, obviously you have to tell it how to solve the problem. So, in terms of like the practicality, we're thinking of a couple things for Turing completeness. Um, I guess an example, what, what is arbitrary calculation? So calculating some digits of pi, right? You can press pi on your calculator, but how's your calculator coming up with digits of pi? I mean, it might have them stored in memory. I actually, I actually don't, don't know this, but uh, trig is a good example, right? Sine, cosine, and tangent. So your calculator is running an algorithm when you pop in, you know, sine of 45 degrees, your calculator is running an algorithm to estimate what that value is. In the, uh, in the olden days, you would have to look up a table of values to figure out a trig function or a logarithm, something like this. So an arbitrary calculation is running an algorithm that can estimate some value. So for example, calculating digits of pi, you can run a program to do that, um, you know, if you don't have it already stored somewhere to access. So this could, be, this could be quite handy, this idea of being able to have arbitrary calculation. Um, in practical terms, we're thinking of two things. We're thinking of loops. So a program, if you can loop back around, then you're probably in the Turing complete realm. Another one is recursion. So if you can define a recursive function, then again, you're probably in the Turing complete realm. So this idea of looping or recursion and coming back, the Opposite of that would just be some linear. So you take some steps to arrive at a you know, predetermined output rather than having some looped 
where we could loop for an indefinite amount of time. Okay, so Turing completeness, um, the other famous, I mean, Turing did quite a bit. The other well-known famous thing from his namesake is the Turing test uh, to tell, to be able to tell if you're dealing with an AI in a computer or if you're dealing with a human behind a terminal. So Turing test gets its name also from Mr. Turing here. Uh, sort of died in his prime. He was almost 42 years old. And according to Wikipedia, it was by cyanide poisoning, which could have been accidental or by suicide. Uh, so we don't know uh, necessarily, and I don't have an opinion either way on it, but there it is. He died quite young. Um, and he, he's also famous for uh, helping out in the war effort from Britain uh, by cracking the German Enigma machine, being part of that team that did that. Uh, as seen in the Hollywood film Enigma, something like this, or uh, does anyone know what movie I'm talking about? Uh, the, the something, it'll come to me. Uh, anyways, uh, so he is you know, a found, really one of these founding figures in computer science. He was doing computer science before there were computers. And so at that time, of course, it wasn't even called computer science. It was just Alan in the corner doing some math trying to tell people that this tape had you know, infinite memory and uh, convincing others that this was a worthy subject to study. Okay, so what does this have to do with Ethereum? Well, in the early days of Ethereum, so the date on here is 2014, uh, Bitcoin at this time was booming. Bitcoin had been around you know, now for five years and had comparatively taken off, you know, now the scale is even larger than it was then. Uh, but people were looking at Bitcoin and saying, well, you know, what else can we do here? This idea of a distributed ledger sounds pretty awesome. People seem to like it. And oh, by the way, people are getting rich. Uh, so what else could we do here um, to either tackle Bitcoin's deficiencies or to maybe implement uh, and innovate some new features? And so one of them is Vitalik. Uh, Buterin, or Buterin, I'm not sure how his last name is pronounced. Most people just call him Vitalik. And uh, so his idea was let's do distributed database, just like Bitcoin. Let's do proof of work consensus to get us bootstrapped, just like Bitcoin. Only instead of using Bitcoin script, we're going to write our own programming language that's going to be able to handle arbitrary or Turing complete calculation. So Vitalik was after this idea of a program being Turing complete and also being distributed. So now we're into the realm of, you know, Turing complete programs can be like sort of crazy, crazy large and complex. And that also means that a big complex program ha could have a lot of security holes or a large surface area for potential attacks. So really upping the complexity in the blockchain space. Uh, and so that is what led to Ethereum. So Let's just click on this. Uh, so this is uh, you know live page still on there after eight or nine years. Uh, and th so this is the post here where Vitalik talks about the Ethereum sale. So this was in July 2014, where Ethereum is going on sale. So he talks about some things here that are sort of very interesting in retrospect. He talks about Difficult legal processes in the U.S. and Switzerland. So in the U.S., if you want to try to sell stuff, all right, you have to convince people that it's not a security, which means that it does not fall under regulation, um, under financial regulation. So there, there was that. They set up the Ethereum Foundation in Switzerland, and so they had to you know, structure the business accordingly. They were basically doing fundraising. They said, hey, we want to do this Turing Complete blockchain and this is going to be our method for fundraising. It hadn't been done before, so this was all brand new. So it gives a little update on what the devs have been up to. You know, uh, they, they don't even know, right? A 10 to 20 second block time down from proposal of 60 seconds. For example, storage and bandwidth requirements. Uh, developments in the mining algorithm, right? Uh, so some other points here about, so they wanted to offer it to U.S. investors, and this is still the goal, right? U.S. is the largest tech market. 
and it's sort of the, uh, you know, there's a lot of extra money flowing around for people to go see kind of investments. So, you know, a lot of Kiwi companies, they start here and then immediately they're also trying to peg these other markets to um, get traction, get more investment. So they said Ether is a product, not a security, right? And this is still being debated today, years later. Ether will not be usable or transferable until the launch. You got 13, oh no, you got 2,000 ETH per BTC. So I don't know if I got the exact date right there, but I said Bitcoin was booming, right? Bitcoin was at $600 at the time. And for this price, you got 2,000 ETH if you participated in the pre-sale. You know, so it's one of these things that like looking back, you're like, oh, wow, what a great opportunity, right? And you absolutely could be rich now. But of course, you never know at the time. And these opportunities come up, maybe not frequently, but when they do come up, often you think, oh, $600 for a Bitcoin. That seems, that seems like a risky endeavor, you know, when I could spend that $600 on enjoying life. Uh, so all, you know, all the details of the pre-sale are here. They talk about saving some coins for the endowment. All right, and so this original endowment of just under 10%, <clears throat> this original endowment is still what funds the Ethereum Foundation to this day. Uh, and then some details about how you can buy it. They created a Python tool. Uh, they use three of four cold storage multi-sig setup, and so on and so on. M of N, Shamir's secret sharing. So we learned about these, uh, I guess, just one week ago, specifically. So all the details are there for the Ethereum presale. So in you know blockchain speak, what they were doing is just trying to raise money so that they could then go out and build a slow decentralized world computer. So sometimes people were calling Ethereum a world computer because all the nodes individually are doing computation and maybe you could leverage that if there's thousands of nodes to um, you know, boost computation overall. So this is from the yellow paper which is the like technical specification of Ethereum. First proposed the idea of Vitalik did in November 2013. So the difference here, you know, is only about seven or eight months between proposing the idea and then coming up with the sale. So I mean, they, these folks move fast, right? And another thing to note about these early days Ethereum creators is that they weren't yet rich. So nowadays they get a lot of criticism for how the Ethereum sale was handled. But in these days, uh, you know, they were all volunteers just doing it because they thought that this would be a good idea. Uh, Vitalik and Gavin, uh, who wrote the yellow paper here, Gavin Wood included. Uh, so here's the key motivation. A blockchain with a Turing complete language and an effectively unlimited inter-transaction storage capability. So those are the two functions. He says that remains unchanged. So I've got the first couple pages of the yellow paper for you to browse. Uh, and now, as I mentioned in an earlier lecture, Gavin Wood is the, I guess, founder of Polkadot, which is a, a, a multi-chain blockchain system. Uh, so he, to the best of my knowledge, doesn't work on Ethereum anymore. He's more interested in uh, his version of blockchains, which he thinks should be best which is Polkadot. Uh, so I won't, I won't really go through this, but you can have a browse. Um, at least in the intro, we should be able to understand most of what's happening in the intro. Um, and then, you know, the rest are kind of like implementation technical details. Um, so not necessarily relevant to learning about how stuff works, but more interesting if you need to know exactly how Ethereum works all by itself. So here's one version by ethdocker.net about how Ethereum as a whole looks. So it's decentralized software, so you can download the software and run it on your computer. Now, if you run a full node, you're gonna need some hardware requirements. You're gonna need to meet some hardware requirements. So ETH Docker, this site that drew this diagram, so they've created like a Docker image to help you run an Ethereum node because it's, you know, historically it's been known to cause some issues, people trying to 
run Ethereum and sync with the blockchain. So like when you first download the client, you have to start at zero, get all the blocks, build up your own chain to validate all the transactions and activity, and then sync with the broader network. And that has historically been quite difficult with Ethereum. So in your full node, you're going to find a few different bubbles. You're going to find a beacon chain, an ethereal, ethereal, Ethereum virtual machine, and a validator client as well. And these are kind of like the main parts that have to work together in your full node. There's a part up here about MEV, so that's uh, maximal extractable value, which has to do with outsourcing your block production in a, in a selfish manner. So we're not going to talk about that. But we are going to talk about the orange here, the consensus client, and the blue, the Ethereum virtual machine. In the green here, we'll mention this as well. So we have validators. And then to generate a validator, you can do it on your own. You need to deposit 32 ETH against your keys. So the list of validators is just a list of keys that all have at least 32 ETH deposited in the contract. And we looked at that contract earlier. So if you get all of these parts working, we have here some synchronization with the broader web, right? So uh, you know, another practical part about running a node is that you need some bandwidth. Your node always has to be on, right? Every 12 seconds, there's a new block. So your node always has to be on and able to up and download information. All right, part one, let's look at consensus. So we have talked a lot about consensus, but always good to review what we've talked about in the past. So distributed consensus here, we need to have all nodes come into agreement. Answering the question of how they come into agreement is part of consensus. Once the nodes agree, we update the state. And someone has to propose updates. So we say, who gets to the privilege of proposing the updates? This is to incentivize people to participate. Um, you know, you don't need, this whole problem goes away if it's a centralized system and you're just paying someone with a paycheck uh, because then that is their incentive to turn up to work. But here people are volunteering compute time and resources, and so we want to incentivize them. So this is a very important part of our distributed system. Uh, and then I've got up here POS for proof of stake consensus. So who gets to do this update? Well, a goal here is that it needs to be fair. Uh, if it's not fair, people are going to figure out that it's not fair, and they're going to leave the system. They're not going to participate. So a sort of entry-level way to do fair is uh, a round robin by stake. So a round robin in a round robin tournament, everybody plays everybody else. So you just go round and iterate through the list. So here we could just have a list of validators. We know them from their keys, and we just order them in some manner. And proportional to how much stake they have, we say, OK, now it's your turn to propose a block. You get the fees. Now it's your turn to propose a block. And you just go down the list. So that's kind of where the um, implementation starts. But the problem with this is that you know in advance all the people that are going to propose a block. So you have a list. And um, you know, to some, to some manner of accuracy, you can project into the future. And you can say, all right, you know, it takes 12 seconds. It takes 12 seconds to propose a block. Multiply in the future. I know when my stake comes up again. I know when yours, when your round comes up again, and so on and so forth. So that's not, that's not really super good, because that information could you know, leverage an attacker that knows in advance, well, I guess everyone knows in advance, when it's coming. So the update here is that we want to have an unknown leader. So you want to know that somebody from the validator set is going to propose a block and earn the rewards, but we don't want to know who it is at least too far in advance. So we'll say the goal is an unknown leader. The way to do that is with a randomness beacon. Um, randomness is a hard problem. We've talked a little bit about it um, on and off. 
I think we'll maybe, we won't talk about Randout today, but we might at some point in the future. So what is a randomness beacon? Well, this is the idea that you have some random source that just tells you who gets to propose the block. And you want it to be random because you don't want to be able to predict it in advance. So if you use like the motion of the planets, that's only random if you don't know what's happening. But if you do know what's happening, you can predict you know, where Mars and Venus are going to be. Uh, and therefore, you know, it seems like you're a, a prophet when really you've just figured out the order. So randomness is hard. How do we find randomness? The way that they're going to implement it is with a pseudo-random pre-selection. So they're going to have a mostly random function. And they're going to select the validators uh, one epoch in advance. The function itself is called Randau. And uh, again, I don't think we'll get into this today, but perhaps at some point in the future. So very important in proof of stake. And I think this is actually the hard part. Proof of stake, the hard part is randomly selecting the winner. You know, in Bitcoin, this is taken care of for us because everyone's just competing in the race. And as soon as you find out that you've got the hash, put your block together, send it out to your peers, and your work is done. You start working on the next one. And then everyone in a cascade finds out that you found one. So that, in a sense, takes care of itself in Bitcoin. And you know, it's one of the reasons why Bitcoin is you know, particularly elegant. OK, so how do the nodes agree in Ethereum? They're going to basically just vote. So a committee or a BFT style system, you just sit around and you vote and you say, I think that one is the leader of the chain. If everyone agrees, that's fine. You know, you sign it and you move on. Uh, again, in Bitcoin, everyone is evaluating for themselves. So there's no vote in Bitcoin. Oh, boy. You all right there? Oh, I just got stuck on something. Maybe yes, maybe no. <laughs> These deaths, man. <laughs> like I, I don't know. I don't know who made the decision to like purchase these desks, but I don't think it was a super terrific decision. Um, right. So where was I? So it, it, in Bitcoin, you don't have to sit around and vote. You just know. You just do a comparison. You say, "What's the cumulative proof of work?" Therefore, I'm going to build on that chain. But in order for everyone to agree here in Ethereum, we're going to have a committee. And we'll see a little bit more details about how the committees are put together. So this is a BFT style. OK, so the validators are also going to vote for a checkpoint. And this checkpoint then is going to determine finality. So by finality, we mean you update the state. See even in our class? Oh, just, just hanging out? That happens sometimes, eh? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so by finality, we mean when we update the state, we want to know for sure that that is the state, and it's not going to be rolled back or be re-updated at some point in the future. So validators handle both of these. So here's a different picture about how these look. So we saw this one before about our definition of a blockchain. So I put the ones in gray here for proof of work that we're not talking about. So proof of stake. You have to stake some tokens. They happen to be worth a lot of money these days in Ethereum. Your penalty is slashing if you don't play by the rules. So anyone can join. It's a civil resistant mechanism because you have to submit your public key into the list of validators. So even if you want to create multiple identities, you still have to have 32 ETH per identity. And then the rewards, you don't get any extra rewards for doing that. It's proportional to total stake. The fork choice rule, we're going to say, if there's a fork in the network, we're just going to vote and say which one is the longest chain or which one's the head of the chain. Sometimes it's called chain tip. 
So we're going to select at least 128 people in our committee every time to vote. In practice, it's a lot more than this. And that's going to determine the longest chain, which in Bitcoin, I said, happens on its own. In terms of finality, for like, is a transaction final or not, we're also going to vote on this as a validator. So the algorithm here is the Casper, the friendly finality gadget, FFG, like Casper the friendly ghost. Uh, and so we're also going to vote on these checkpoints. And after the checkpoints are met, we're going to say, forget about it. There's nothing you can do. We're not going back. And that's going to give us some confidence in these transactions. Anytime we see these numbers, right, two-thirds and one-third, so two-thirds honest and one-third malicious, this is the BFT style, Byzantine fault tolerance. Uh, and BFT is generally handled by voting in a committee. Regarding our liveness and safety here, so for our committee, because we're voting on it, our safety is guaranteed just based on the majority of our votes. The liveness, this means can our chain produce another block, right? We don't want it to get stuck. We don't want it to get stuck in some infinite computation whereby nobody else can advance the network. So that's the idea of liveness. And here the liveness has been updated with a tick as probabilistic. This is where some people point to to say that there are some you know, potential flaws in Ethereum's implementation uh, is this idea of the liveness here. Uh, and so th there is a technical proof in the paper here, and they've concluded that uh, it does, the Ethereum implementation does maintain liveness and safety. Thirty-two slots or blocks in an epic. So rather than just a continual chain of blocks coming in, which is how proof of work Ethereum worked. Uh, the blocks were like every 12 to 15 seconds. Now the blocks are every 12 seconds, right? It's, it's determined in advance. You have, the, you have a pre-selection of the leaders, and then your clock just advances a wall clock time every 12 seconds. So there's no sort of, uh, there's not a lot of latency or delay, and there's no, there's no possibility of waiting a whole hour like there is in, in Bitcoin for a block. So they're called slots. When you get on uh, beaconchain.in, you get on Beacon Chain. they're called slots. So we've got 0 to 31. And there's a clock here that is quite faint, but it goes up to 6 minutes 24 seconds. So that is 12 seconds times 32 slots. And that's called an epic. It takes about two and a half epics for finality in, in practice. So that's about 14 minutes, 15 minutes to finalize a transaction or a state update. What we're going to do for every epic is we're going to take all the validators, and right now there's over 700,000 of them. We're going to take all the validators, and we're going to distribute them between 0 and 32. So n validators are distributed evenly among 32 slots. And we're going to pick one of those validators to be the block producer. That's like the winner. That's the person that um, gets the block reward. We're going to try to limit the block producers from being chosen too early in advance. We don't want that information to leak out and to have an advantage for people that can find out. So we're going to limit that to just at the start of the epic, assigning the block producers. Uh, and we're going to have one checkpoint per epic. So in an epic here, what, uh, if you have a validator, maybe you're, you're allocated to number nine <coughs> at the start. <coughs> if you're allocated to number nine at the start, you're going to vote on chain, chain head. You're also going to vote on, um, you're also going to vote on the checkpoint, the finality. So every six minutes, your validator has two votes to do, and that's like the work that you're putting in. And if your validator isn't working, then you have the potential to be slashed. So everybody is participating at least twice every six and a half minutes. All right, so it's not like you don't have any downtime. You can't like 
shut down, update your OS, and then come back, you're going to miss out on those votes, and that's going to be recorded. So another view at how this works, here in blue, we have all the possible validators. One is going to get chosen for slot one as a proposer. At least 128 will form a committee. And that's going to repeat for all the possible slots. This randow function is going to randomly select who gets to go where. And the reason why we're going to form committees is just for efficiency. So if we have 128 people all voting for the tip of the chain, we're going to aggregate their signatures, and that's going to be more efficient than having each one sign a vote independently. Um, and so that you know, adds some efficiency into our system, and it lets us have everyone participate, which is really what you want. You want to feel like your node, or to know that your node is actually doing work and participating in the system. Right, and what's it participating for? It's maintaining consensus. And it's occasionally earning rewards. <clears throat> okay, so another word that comes up a lot is attestations, <clears throat> which is just voting. So here's a quick look at how this could work. First block comes in slot one. Alice is the block proposer. <clears throat> Two validators vote that this one is the head of the chain. This validator is offline and misses the vote. That's okay, we only need a super majority to advance. Next block comes along, Bob proposes it. These two validators are going to attest that block two is now the chain head. This validator comes online and hasn't seen Bob's block, and so this validator is a bit behind and votes for Alice's block over here. Again, that's okay because we need a supermajority in order, we need two thirds in order to maintain our decision making about which one is at the head of the chain. Uh, and then we move on. Eve proposes this block, and now everybody votes that this block is at the chain head, okay, and um, these. People are all grouped together as a committee, again, to add some efficiency. We're going to group everyone into a committee. Now, that doesn't mean that only 128 people right, are there. Uh, everybody is split. All end validators are split between 32 slots. So your, uh, your node is doing work at least once, or at least for uh, two, two votes every six and a half minutes. Okay so, okay, so that's uh, a kind of an overview of how proof of stake consensus is working on Ethereum. The hard parts are implementation details, so coding it up and making it work. Uh, the other hard part for proof of stake is randomly choosing who is there and then having it such that in an open system people can validate and, on their own and see <clears throat> that it's doing what it should. All right, so that was Beacon Chain. <clears throat> the, the name Beacon Chain, right, this comes from the idea of a random beacon. So ideally, we have like a random beacon out in the ether, a random beacon in the sky that can feed us randomness, and we have no idea how the beacon was put together, but we never observe the pattern. We never see any contradictions. So that's ideally how it happens, is that we get this beacon of randomness. The way that your computer implements this as you just call the like operating system random function. So your OS has a random function built in, which I believe we've seen in some of our Python code already where you're extracting some randomness that way. And that's a perfectly fine way to do it, although you might want something more sophisticated when you're managing billions of dollars in a distributed system. Um, you know, there, there used to be like when you would create a wallet online to get the randomness in your private key, it would ask you to like move the mouse around the screen. And so you would be putting in entropy by randomly picking x, y coordinates on the screen that presumably nobody knows in advance. 
Uh, and uh, what, what's another one? Cloudflare is the web provider. Um, they have cameras pointed at a wall of lava lamps to get some randomness uh, in, in their system. So, you know, a lava lamp has like, I guess, random fluid distribution shapes that, that can be found. And so they just have a camera pointing at the lamp and then the camera is obviously a 2D pixel image and you're just taking that data and converting it uh, and using that as your random beacon. So that's a good one, right? Uh, in the casino, dice and cards, these are also good ways to get, get randomness. Anyways, that's where the name beacon comes from. So we have some communication here with the EVM. So the EVM is the Ethereum virtual machine. And Ethereum itself can be represented as a state transition machine. Okay, so this is another uh, computer science thing, right, where we have world state. Uh, so I guess uh, sigma for state t, at time t. And then we have some updates, and we get over here to t plus one, right? So world state t, and then Jeff participates in Ethereum's presale, and now, you know, world state t plus one, I'm rich. Uh, I, I, I did not participate in Ethereum's presale, but reviewing those numbers, right, makes me wish I was paying attention. In between, we could do whatever we want in order to get to state t plus one. And so in a blockchain, we're just gonna have some transactions and we're gonna batch them or package them in a block. And that gets us to t plus one. So the important point here is that these transactions are atomic, which means you cannot divide them any further. So there's no state t plus 0 0.5, right? If you think of like a continuous mathematical function or if you think about like, phys like uh, in physics, time and space being discrete or continuous, right? This is not continuous. So we have t, we have t plus one. So we have, you know, block 77 and then we have block 78. There's no in between. If your update fails, okay, all of these transactions don't make it. It's not like only some of them make it through. If something happens, all of these transactions are reverted or rolled back. Now they're not really rolled back, they just don't get confirmed at state t plus one. Inside of our world state here, basically what we're looking at is just a big list. So we've got all the addresses that have been created in Ethereum and we've got the state at those addresses. So if we start thinking about how many potential addresses people have created on Ethereum and all the stuff that it's tracking, we can maybe imagine that Ethereum is getting quite big Okay, using the same style of diagram, here's our world state, which is just a list of everyone that's ever transacted in Ethereum. An address can be a contract or a public key. And then we have the world state, and the world's, sorry, then we have the account state. And so we say that Ethereum is an account-based system for this reason. You've got your address, and then inside your address you've got a, a native balance of ether, which is you know, the, the token that you pay for gas that runs the EVM. You can also have you know, other token balances in there, but you've got your native balance. Uh, and then you have access to some storage and some code as well, which aren't part of state, okay, that are referenced elsewhere. So every account has a state with potential access to storage and code. This is different from uh, Bitcoin, which uses a UTXO model, the unconfirmed transaction uh, output model. And so in Bitcoin, you know, you don't have any storage or code. Technically, you don't have a balance either. If you have a wallet and it says what your balance is, um, it's just adding up all of the UTXOs to give you the total. So a slightly different model here between Bitcoin and Ethereum. Two account types. So an externally owned account. This is our regular one that we create. Address, nonce balance, and then a contract one, 
which has the same thing but now has access to storage and code. Contract contains EVM code and an externally owned account is controlled by a private key. So a contract doesn't have a private key. A contract has an owner and the owner has a private key just as kind of like a, a wee difference between these two, right? Externally owned accounts, this is just a normal public-private key pair here. Now importantly, these addresses have to look the same. So these are both 160-bit um, addresses, and so if you just see the string, you don't know if, if it's an account or an address, but you can look it up. So two account types in Ethereum. So what, what does the EVM actually do? So as a virtual machine, right, everyone's running the software on their computer, so they're not actually, like, your computer has its own access to real hardware. When you download and run software, it's often allocating things in a virtual manner. It might also be accessing your computer's hardware. But here, because of the nature of dis the distributed system, uh, the actual computation is going to be done in this virtual process, and it's going to be tracked and distributed that way. So the virtual machine, you know, it runs on your computer in your node, but it's in a virtual, like, emulated manner. And uh, so VMs also, they're very similar to virtual environments. If you're, like, setting up your environment for coding and you don't want access to certain libraries, you set up a virtual environment. So the EVM is stack-based. This is what a stack can look like. So stack-based computation has a structure where you build on top of one another your opcodes, and then you have to come off the top. So if you want to add two numbers, you have to push one onto the stack, and then push two onto the stack, and then you're going to add those numbers. So you're going to pull two and one, add them together, get three, and then push three back onto the stack. Uh, and so that's what stack-based computation is like. It's sometimes called a LIFO, a last-in, first-out structure. And it's run here per call. So every call in a smart contract, okay, is going to build its own stack, and then it's volatile. So the stack isn't stored. It's created, and then when you're done with it, it's overwritten. We have a fixed size here, 1,024, and we'll talk more about that in a bit, and let's have a look. So we can see here, I mean, add is pretty important, right? Minimum gas, stack input, stack output, A plus B, multiply, subtract, divide. So all of our math operations prioritized here with the smallest opcode. Uh, and then we can, you know, scroll down. Uh, these ones, 56 and 57. So jump, this is important. Alter the program counter. So the program counter maintains your position in the stack. So you need to know where you're at. And jump is important because in the stack you could jump to a different spot and then you can loop through the stack. And so if we're thinking loops, we're reminded that Turing complete programming also often involves looping. And so here in Ethereum, we can jump, and we can jump conditionally based on the condition. And this is, this functionality is important to allow us to have Turing complete. Uh, this one as well, jump to a specific destination. Uh, anyway, anyways, down the bottom here, there's one called self-destruct. That's kind of interesting. Right here, down the end, halt execution and register account for later deletion. So there we go, self-destruct. So in terms of the opcodes, you know, a, a high-level language, you don't have to worry about these. Solidity is doing all this in the background. But someday you're going to have an error. You're going to encounter a problem that you think you should be able to solve, and you're going to have to dig into the opcodes to see exactly what is happening behind the scenes. 
And I'll summarize the, uh, some of these stats here at the end compared to Bitcoin. Okay, so <laughs> here's a beast. Uh, this diagram is still circulating on the internet because it's particularly well done. Uh, this is from 2016, so it's old, it's out of date. Down here at the bottom we can see it says proof of work. So this is old Ethereum. Up at the top, an interpretation of the yellow paper. So in that reference specification, somebody went through it to diagrammatically represent Ethereum. So it's kind of like a top level picture of all of Ethereum and it gives you, I think it gives us a couple, a couple things here. One of them is that if we can go through it and not necessarily understand, but at least if we can go through it and follow the logic and be able to look up what's happening, then that contributes to our understanding as a whole. And you know, the second thing I think that it tells us is that Ethereum is pretty complex. So there's a lot happening here. And um, this idea of complexity is often a criticism of Ethereum. Is that like the code is unwieldy, the nodes are huge. Um, at some point, you know, the program's gonna halt and, and that's gonna be it. So that is, uh, and I think it's a fair criticism of Ethereum. So here we see EVM for Ethereum Virtual Machine defines the result of a single cycle of the state machine. We have our instruction set, so this is our stack. And these are our op codes that we're allowed to use on the stack. Again, uh, this is all handled by your compiler, but you know your compiler also has to play by the rules. So there's things that you cannot do, and there's um, efficient and sort of best practice ways to do certain things. In terms of the execution environment, <coughs> We need to know the owner, the sender, the gas price, the input data, there's an address there, value for pass, passing it. We have to know some block header information and so on. And we come down here to the iterator function which determines how we get to the next cycle of computation. So we're gonna get an instruction from I sub B Going back, what's I sub B? That's our machine code, which comes out of our compiler. Okay, so that's gonna get the next instruction. And at some point here, we have to subtract our gas used. So this is the key step. If you just have an infinite loop, like well, true, I plus plus, then you're going to occupy all the resources in the Ethereum network until the end of time, right? Until somebody turns it off and says, let's start again. So we need some way for the program to halt, which also comes back to the idea of Turing completeness called the halting problem, which says, can we determine for sure that our program will not run forever, right? If it runs forever, that's a problem because then you can't update the state and you, you can't use the program to do anything. So you do not want it to run forever. And this is where gas comes in. As soon as we're out of gas, even if we programmed in an infinite loop, we're gonna to be told to halt, all right? And then we proceed to the next transaction. If we think about the liveness of our blockchain, it's very important that we halt computation at some point to process the next blocks. Uh, so all this stuff in gray, is all volatile and all goes away in the next instruction. The stuff here in red, in the world state, this is persistent. So account balances, you, right, you don't want them to go away. And then storage and code, also you don't want to go away. So we need to keep this in mind. This is like um, clearing the cache, right? There are certain things we're gonna write to disk if we need them again, and there are certain things we're gonna let go. So all this stuff gets updated every single state update uh, and then processed in another block. All right, so throwing up a super complex diagram and saying, oh yeah, you should look at it. I mean, that's not super helpful. So let's try to boil some of this down into you know, 
bite-sized digestible chunks. So let's look at here some data flow. So I'm gonna start with this idea that I have. My idea is let's create a marketplace. So back to Vitalik's motivation for creating Ethereum. In his original white paper, he detailed all these use cases of a distributed Turing complete computer that you could not do on Bitcoin. One of the use cases is a distributed or decentralized marketplace. So now these are quite common, uh, a DEX and a marketplace, there's not a whole lot of difference between them. So that's our idea, we wanna create something. How are we gonna do it? Well, next step is gonna be to code it up. So you go, uh, you, know, you, you go to the yellow paper and you say, how do I code it up? I need to write the program in Solidity. Nowadays, you go to Remix or you uh, use uh, Truffle and Ganache to do this. So you code up your marketplace in Solidity. Uh, there, there's a few other languages that people are using for smart contracts. One's called Viper. I can't think of a third one off the top of my head, but I'm sure that there is one where people are trying to like iterate and improve on um, the original Solidity, right? Uh, now a few years old from 2014. So from there, Solidity is going to either through a Web3 API. So if you're using uh, Remix, you're gonna inject that Solidity and it's then, it needs to, you know, it needs to contact the Ethereum network. It needs to get that code out somehow. So it'll be compiled into bytecode. And then you're probably contacting a service like Infura, which is responsible um, for, the, you know, they basically run a full node and then they pay you to query the node. Pay you, they, the other way around. And then you pay them to query the node. So there's a few other services that will do this as well. Part of the problem is that running your own Ethereum node is quite cumbersome. So from there, Infura is gonna have their own node running. Now it's not their own implementation. The most common is called geth for Go Ethereum, the, or the G is for Go, written in Go. And so through your API call, you're gonna contact a full node behind Infura's service, and they're gonna return values coming out of, of geth. Next line here, what happens at the node? So when you download geth, get it installed, get it synced, you can either use your own console, <clears throat> here to you know, chat with Ethereum and uh, synchronize with the network, or uh, you're using geth through the API. But either way, what it's doing then is it's contacting these three clients. So execution client, that's the one that updates the state and you know, processes your loop. Beacon chain, this is the one that maintains consensus, so it collects all the votes and it validates all the transactions. So this also has to happen in the node. And then the validation client as well, it's basically just maintaining a list of all the validators. And then from there, you know, every 12 seconds you have to gossip with the network to find out the updates, to find out what's happening. So you can interact with all this through the geth console and there's pretty good documentation about how to do this or through an API through a third party. And again, there's also good documentation to do this. Downside to using Infura uh, is that you probably have to pay. And Infura runs a lot of the Web3 infrastructure, just like Cloudflare runs a lot of the Web2 infrastructure. And so that could be like a single point of failure, right? If, uh, if Infura, for whatever reason, decides they don't wanna be in business anymore, or some of the other, some of the other, um, I guess, centralized services. So I just pulled this this morning. Um, let's just go to the website. So Ethereum node tracker. Uh, so we found over 10,000 nodes. Bitcoin has a similar problem when you're trying to like count the nodes, and that's that you're not counting all of them. You're just sort of counting the easily pingable nodes within your reach. Um, 
You know, this number is a lot smaller than validators, right? There's hundreds of thousands of validators. And that's because most people running a validator are not running a node. Um, we can see some stats here. Germany sort of plays punches above their weight, I'd say. Oh, maybe not. I'm uh, just making these numbers up. Maybe Lithuania punches above their weight. I have no idea how big Lithuania is, but uh, New Zealand's on the map, which is good. They didn't forget about us. It says that there's two nodes. This morning when I looked, there were four. So I don't know. Anyone running a full node out there? I am, I am not. Uh, Australia, 33. Russia, 90. US, tons. Germany, heaps. Hundred and eighty five. Again, I don't know how this works with being able to reach through the GFC. And for those in China, in terms of how their node is connecting with the broader web. So like it's probably underrepresented. Underrepresented there. Um, perhaps with these types of numbers. Uh, you only get a trend, and then if you track the trend over time, like maybe this total nodes, that can help. But anyways, so we have some stats here. Here if we look at Geth, we can see that it's you know over three quarters of all of the clients, all running on Linux. Aragon, 12%, a few of the other slices here, GQDC, Open Ethereum, never mind. There's a long form of Go Ethereum at 1%. So this picture, I think the point of this picture is has to do with centralization, right? We say like, if everybody's running the same client, then perhaps we're a bit more centralized than we would like to be because then fewer people are responsible for maintaining and updating the client and uh, you know, that could be a problem. And so, you know, we'd like to see this pie to have at least larger slices down this end, but there's a large variety if you just look at the names here, right? And you can, you know, code your own, you can read the yellow paper and you can write up your own reference implementation, right? That would be a terrible assignment to have to do. Uh, client type, this would be the version, I think, that they're running. So again, we can see that not everybody is up to date, um, probably because it takes a bit of work to update your software. All right, so how hard is it to run an Ethereum full node? To run a pruned version, which is a light client, you need two terabytes of SSD which I think you can pick up for, say, over 100, less than $200. Uh, we can see here some stats. It grows at about 14 gigabytes per week, right? So this is every time somebody puts something into storage or every time somebody deploys a smart contract, that bytecode gets stored forever in Ethereum. Down here in this search result, it says, an archive node is around 12 terabytes. So this is why people are paying Infura to do this because they don't want to run 12 terabytes of software. That's a job in itself, right? The DevOps to keep that going in an archive node. And um, you know, at least if you're developing or if you're testing, it's pretty cheap to use these third-party services. Uh, two terabytes on Aragon here, which will grow over time. I'm not sure exactly what's going on here. It's probably that Aragon has some newer storage implementation, so it starts out smaller, but again, it's still growing. All right, so what can we do with this? We've got a Turing complete decentralized computer that's pretty unwieldy. It's got a lot going on. Uh, you need 12 terabytes after the network's been running for eight, nine years. You need 12 terabytes to run a full archival node what can we do with it? 
So I just kind of looked up, I just went to uh, DAP radar and looked up the most common. Uh, so this list is different than the one I put in the slides. So I'm not too sure what I've missed there. Anyways, so Stargate basically is a bridge. And so we have, you know, 2 million wallets interacting with Stargate in the last month. Uh, Lifeform, I don't know what that is. It's on BNB chain. It has no balance. Galaxy, again, I don't know what that is. PancakeSwap, decentralized exchange. So a million wallets in the last 30 days. Uh, Uniswap, this is what I was expecting to be at the top. Uniswap, decentralized exchange, 700,000 wallets. PancakeSwap, uh, Rarible, NFT exchange, half a million wallets in 30 days. So that's pretty good for an NFT platform. TVL is a uniquely blockchain metric because in other companies you can't just go in there and like see their finances, but in the, you know the blockchain you can. So TVL says how many people are using Lido here, which is liquid staking for Ethereum. So this is Ethereum staking. Well, they've got 13.8 billion you know, total value locked, registered in their, in their contracts on their platform. And so, you know, that, that, can, that can tell you something. It at least can tell you a ranking of how they compare to others. So we have some DeFi, SummerFi, MakerDAO um, as a stablecoin lending platform, 5 billion. Uniswap DEX, 3 billion. Aave, decentralized lending, Curve, and so on. So these are kind of Three, four, five, six are kind of the uh, long time use cases of Ethereum in terms of decentralized finance, with now Lido maybe last year or two really perking up. Okay, so this is essentially what people are using Ethereum for. And you know, at this stage, it comes down to like money. So a lot of the stuff has to do with money. Not that that is a bad thing. But that seems to be the most obvious use of this different ways <clears throat> to either uh, trade, lend, borrow, uh, swap, and, and so on. The exception being NFTs as a marketplace, so Rarible, OpenSea, these ha also have large audiences and use cases. All right, so let's try to summarize this idea of Ethereum came in to be Turing complete. And where are we at with that? Or maybe what are some of the obvious differences between Ethereum and Bitcoin? So Bitcoin is not, and it's intentionally not Turing complete, such that we don't want you to write complex programs that can you know, do unknown things. We just want Bitcoin to track UTXOs, just to track value. Um, so loops, Bitcoin doesn't have them. Bitcoin can't do recursion. And the reason why Bitcoin can't do loops is there's no jump in the opcode set. So that's how you can you know, limit the set. You can say, well, these are the only codes that are allowed. So Ethereum has the jump and the jump destination, but Bitcoin doesn't. Recursion in Ethereum, you can do it, but you're gonna have to pay. You're gonna have to pay that gas fee every time you make a call. So I'm not sure the it has an obvious use case, but you can do it. Bitcoin, again, you cannot forget about it. So Ethereum has more potential through the opcodes that are allowed in the EVM compared to Bitcoin. So they both kind of run, well, they both do run a stack computation. Um, Bitcoin's language is called script, and you have 78 codes to choose from. Just to give you an, an idea, you can do more because you've got more option with the Ethereum opcodes. Not that like the absolute number means that one is better or worse, just to give you an idea of what is possible. They both run a stack limit, which is pretty much, which are very similar in size. So this again is how you're going to limit the program size that people are putting in a block. Um, so if you need, you know, you need to find a way around. If your program needs more than this many spots accessing the stack, then you need to find a way around it. Do it a different way. 
Um, the idea here with these limits is that we do not want the program to execute indefinitely. It has to stop at some point so it can update. The chain can stay alive. I guess the fundamental way that they, they do this, both for Ethereum and Bitcoin, is on these limits. So Ethereum takes a gas limit per block. So if you need more than 30 million in gas, so every computation requires gas, if you need more than, you know, even add and subtract, if you need more than that, you have to find a way around it. It's not going to fit in a block. Bitcoin takes a slightly different approach. They have a weight. So it used to be four megabytes. Now it's a weight of four million, which is very similar to the megabyte size. But uh, as a weighting, there's some different calculation that goes into it. So here's a solidity loop, run out of gas, just say well true, right? It'll never be false, and it'll just chew through your gas. So your gas cannot be redeemed. At the end of this, either the execution completes or it doesn't. That's the atomic nature. So at the end of this, you know, the gas will be gone, but the computation will not complete, and so it will not get updated. But you don't get that gas back. And so that uh, forces people to be efficient with their use of this decentralized computer. OK, so that's what I've got for Ethereum. Right Next up, spring break. I will not be here next week. Coming up after that, we've got privacy, security, DeFi as a general form. I may make some tweaks to this. Um, I think I have a lecture on DeFi ready to go. I don't have one yet on privacy and security, so those are to be determined. 